Fire City. And I have to always thank Bowling Green State University at this time because I was their representative to Xi'an. We, a PGSU and Xi'an International Studies University had an agreement. So they sent their faculty and sent me over there. There was a little sacrifice on my part because I gave up nine months or ten months of salary plus the fringe benefits. However, they furnished an apartment and paid me what was comparable to $500 a month. <laughs> but it gave me a wonderful opportunity to know the country, to travel extensively, so it was all worthwhile. Okay, today we're, to we're going to talk about leaving Xi'an and flying way down to Hainan Island. And every so often the news has a broadcast about China claiming another island in the South China Sea. And the other country that may be claiming it is the Philippines. So there's a couple hundred islands right here in the South China Sea. So Hainan will be on the news, I assure you, because it is supposedly the center of GhostNet. That's an internet conspiracy that the IP addresses are always traced back to Hainan Island. And it is supposedly, have we have gotten into some political systems, think election, uh, infrastructure, think water, and uh, economic uh, banking and finance. So that things are going on on Hainan Island. Plus the fact on the southern part of the island, they have built a launch pad for their own um, space station, international. So we, have our, we share our international space station, Japan and most of the rest of the world. They want to build their own. So all of that is taking place on this little island of Hainan. But it's not so little because it's China's second largest island next to Taiwan. So whatever your view is on Taiwan, I'm just saying it's second size to Taiwan. Okay, and it's very close to where we fought war for a long time, Gulf of Tonkin and Vietnam. Okay, so this is December, and we only have four days, a long weekend, maybe five, because the whole world celebrates Christmas, December 24th, 25th. And I don't like cold weather. Anybody that knows me, I do not like cold weather. So, I have to find a travel partner to go down to Hainan Island for four to five days. And I did. We fly, and you'll see a picture of her coming up. We fly from Xi'an, wonderful airport, down to Haipu on the island. And then we take a four-hour little mini bus, and we go down this shore to Sanya which is noted, it is the Hawaii of China. It is warm, there's resorts, the rich go there to vacation, it's tropical, it's a paradise. It's a very, very beautiful place. Okay, enough on the maps. Along on the coastline, on our bus, we see the water buffalo. And we see women, that back row is filled with pickers. And what are they picking? Um, it might be white pearl peanuts. And the peanuts grow more on trellises there. We think of peanuts as more of a ground a crop. But there it's, uh, it might be white pearl peanuts. And then we know what that is, right? <laughs> yeah, right? Nice orderly. And then finally we get to um, our beach. We check into our hotel. We go out walking on the beach. And it's really a good time because it's evening and the fishermen are bringing in their catch of the day. So they're all waiting there with the nets ready to take the fish. Take a look at the red boots. I could not take a picture of the red lips because most of the workers have lips that are as red as those boots. They spit. So when you walk around the beach, you see these puddles of spit that red. 
So it's like, gee, what's going on here? <coughs> Actually, it's the betel, B-E-T-E-L, nut. It's a narcotic. It's a feel-good stimulant. <laughs> I'm surprised it hasn't reached the United States. <laughs> okay. But, you know, I just can't go take a picture of somebody's red lips. That would not be very polite. So the red boots tell the story. And then they dump their nets, or the fish into the nets, and everybody comes to shop for their supper. Probably restaurant owners and store managers come to the beach to pick up a fish. And the nets are all put together nicely, and there's that evil eye. You know, the evil eye scares away the demons. We want to protect those nets. And then there's Owlet my traveling partner. She's a very interesting lady. She's from Germany. And from Omelette, I learned that the Germans are very strategic people. Number one, she's hired by a consortium of universities back home. So she teaches German one, two, three, and four. So the best students she picks out to those universities that support her. So they're getting the cream of the crop in the German universities. Also, when there's a business person come over to China, they contact Alma because she can translate everything. And Hangzhou, which Marco Polo said is the most beautiful city in the world back in the 13th century, every taxi in Hangzhou is a VW. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, they were very strategic. So anyway, that's all it. Good trip. She lived in the same uh, apartment block I did. And there's the, the catch. The fresh catch it even goes to the seafood market or the restaurant. And let me tell you, when you go to a seafood restaurant, that guy on the right, he has 30 different cubicles like that filled with all kinds of seafood. I can't identify them. All I remember is eating a starfish arm. It was not nice. Not nice. Okay. And because we're in the tropics, we have the tropical fruits. Some I can't identify. But I did have a little um, pineapple. Stick, they stick a straw in the coconut. I'm sorry, I say pineapple. They strip the, stick a straw in the coconut, and then you walk around sipping the coconut water or milk, whatever is there. I hope maybe you could probably identify more fruit than I can. <laughs> it's pretty different. Okay. We're still on the same beach. We, we don't really leave the beach. And they, we go to a place, I can't pronounce Chinese, sorry. And it's English translation is end of the earth. So it's supposed to be where the heaven, the sky, and the earth, and the sea meet. And it's a very uh, romantic place. A lot of engagements and weddings take place here. And it's so important in the Chinese culture that they put it on the back of their two yuan bill. It's pretty neat, actually. And there's Almond showing her strength. <laughs> she is really showing her strength there at the end of the earth. And I, I had to settle for the cacti growing out of the rocks. <laughs> okay. Now, we're not just satisfied being on Hainan. We have to take a boat to one of those little islands that I talked about. And the little island is noted for monkeys. They say they have 2,000 species of monkeys. Um, that's a lot. And I can't tell one species of monkey from the next. So they said, okay. But we have to take a boat over, a very short boat ride, right? half hour. And as we're passing by, we see the floating villages where the people live. About um, 1,500 houseboats or junks are there. That's permanent housing. And they, they cast their fish, fish nets out. They think they're farm fishing. And there's probably about 600 of these nets that are out there taking in the, the life from the sea. It's their way of life. It's a minority group called the Tonka. 
And I have to show more of the picture, but I, I have to go to the internet to get an aerial view. To the right, you have Hainan Island. To the left, you have the Tonka Village. Village of little fishing boats. Oh, this monkey island. This is a story here. Okay, we get to the island, and the monkeys are up in the palm trees behind me. So I give my camera to Alma and said, please take a picture of me with the monkeys in the tree. So she's positioning herself, herself, and she's saying, Barbara, the monkey's down from the tree. Barbara, the monkey is behind you. Barbara, the monkey is coming. And the monkey is coming. Oh, shoot. Oh, I'm going to go back. The monkey is coming because from here to here to here, and there's my handbag. <laughs> the monkey wants that handbag and my granola bar. <laughs> All that, I told you she's strategic and she's a brave woman. She fights with that monkey. She drops my camera, she goes to that monkey, and the monkey's squeeching and screeching and screeching, and she's just shouting, and she's, she wins. She wins. <laughs> She saved my handbag because she said the secret, if you ever get in a fight with a wild animal, look them in the eye. But it says you look the animal in the eye, that means you're not afraid of them. And you're going to come out the winner. I never want to get that close. <laughs> this is like, okay, Almond, that's fine. Okay. The last time I saw one of those little devils was in Gibraltar. They're the same little pests. They're always going after your food. Always. So, um, there it is. And we become friends. <laughs> we become friends. Oh, they're so sweet. No, they're just well trained. <laughs> okay. Now, to end this part of the show, I'm showing, I had to go to the internet to get this because Hainan is comparable to Davos as far as the political leaders of the country, the, the, the thinkers of the country, the intelligentsia. That's where they gather now. And this is one of the Marriott. Someone told me here that she loves the Marriott. So here this Marriott is in Haiku. And I looked up the price. Only $125 a night. Pretty good, huh? <laughs> And that's only one of the, of the beautiful resorts that are on Haiku. I'm not. Okay. Now I knew I was only there four days, so I knew I didn't have enough material to talk on and on and on about the island. So we're going to talk another province in China, Yunnan province. Yunnan province is the most diverse. It has, China claims, 56 ethnic groups. And how they treat them depends on their geographic location, what natural resources they have, and quite a few other things. So again, now this is the, the well, I better say something in between here. From December, from that vacation in Hanan Island, I could go back and well, we had to teach. Um, and it was exam time. So we gave our exams. And then around January 1st, we had another vacation. Well, that's when my husband flew to Auckland, New Zealand. And we spent one month traveling in New Zealand. Very, very nice trip. And then, uh, so, and then there's still more vacation because Chinese New Year is not till February. <coughs> And so, oh my goodness, and everything closes. Restaurants close, stores close. I would have no food to eat. The dorm is no longer heated. I find a place to go here. Well, we gotta go to another warm place, right? So we go to Yunnan province, and it's very close to Hainan Island. Okay, we're going down south, and it's, it's a pretty large, it's a pretty large province. So who am I going to travel with this time? Alma went back to Germany to visit her families. So I have to find another travel partner. I'm always looking for travel partners. Right now it's one to Cuba. But I'm still looking for just one. Okay, 
So here we go. Yunnan, the map. We fly in from Xi'an to Kunming, which is the capital of, of Yunnan province. Then we always travel by public bus, or we hire a driver. And then from there we go to Dali, which is a very famous city in China. And then from there, another bus to Lijiang, which is another very famous city in China. I'm saying this all the time because they are. Oh, Shangri-La, we missed. But that's not the lost horizon, Shangri-La. If that would be the case of eternal youth, I would be looking different. <laughs> I would we, we miss Shangri-La. Okay, and then from um, Lijiang, we travel with bike plane down way down here, Laos is right here, into Jinghong. Now, that province is, is in red, dotted in red. It probably belonged to Vietnam or Laos or somebody else at a certain time in history. And at some point, you know, the big mainland China took it up because it's like an independent, I don't know, not an independent. It's not an independent country, it's like a province that, you know, Beijing is far away, so they pretty much are okay by themselves. Okay. Now there's Tina. <laughs> I, they all take English names because we're so poor in pronunciation of Chinese. It's a very difficult language. You know that the ending of a word can have four different sounds. And, and like, one, two, three, four. E also so. If you take and give that fourth one the wrong ending, it means death. That's why the Chinese are very superstitious with four. You never say the word four. You never have four people at a party. You just you avoid four altogether because of the ending of the word. So Tina is a professor in the School of Tourism. Her English is perfect. Um, she has written, she is one of the authors of the book that the guides use that take you on tours through Shia. So she's a pretty sophisticated traveler. And it's the year of the dog. You know the Zodiac 12 years and all of that. It's the year of the dog. And my friend told me to make a special point to say that dog is not a real dog. <laughs> so it is not. Spot's not real there. Okay, that's our hotel. Okay. Probably no one else likes this picture but me. And it, we're down in the capital of Kunming, and you can see the um, rebuilding of part of the city. You know, there, there's rubble, they're tearing down, and you have, you know, the, the favorite method of transportation for locals are uh, motorcycles. Bicycles, okay, but look at this woman. To me, she represents China on the move. Because usually women in that part of the world take little tiny steps. That's feminine. They walk slowly. Not this woman, man. She is taking a long western stride. And that town in her country is on the move. Now we're in the old part of Kuming. And there's a Muslim minority. The Muslims there have fought a lot of wars in Yunnan province. Please, I don't remember all these wars and all dates of these wars. But the Hui, H-U-I, is the Muslim minority. And so they have their own quarter in Kuming. And we're sort of there. And I like to eat at street vendors, you know? Good food. Now, I'm not sure what this is. Does anybody want to guess? What's the man selling? What Pardon? Monkey. <laughs> oh, gosh, no! <laughs> oh, please, no. <laughs> it is uh, tofu. Oh. It's tofu. It's he's slicing the tofu here. Oh, shoot. I always, I want the, the, the pointer. Um, Tina is there, so <laughs> she tests the first. Yeah, not that great. So she tests it, then I take a bite out of it. Now, I'm probably the only foreigner this guy has seen. You know, a lot of, a lot of foreigners do not visit Yunnan province. So he's probably saying, hmm, she's a great foreigner. 
And by the way, foreigner applies to anybody. Because if you're walking the streets, they don't know if you're Spanish, Italian, they don't know what Western nationality you are. You are foreigner. It reminds me of the Catholic Church. You're either Catholic or you are non-Catholic. Don't, don't bother with all those designations, you know, all those denominations. So that store in the background is a big pharmacy. Not that I can read anything, but I did buy a tiger ball. Just in case I have a torn muscle or something, I'll have the tiger ball. Okay. Oh, it's Chinese New Year. That means party time at night. And you go into one of those storefronts, and it opens up, and there's 30 vendors of all food. And in the middle are the picnic tables. You can have all kinds of food imaginable. And it's really, really fun. Okay, so now we go in the next day, we run we get a bus, and we go to the Stone Forest. Beautiful countryside, taken from the bus window. The limestone formations, karst. Actually, one of the national parks in Cuba we visit has a lot of these karst formations. And the minority people living there are the E people. And in their native dress. She was a very good guy. And oh, Barbara. These, it's a story. It's a romantic story of those two stones with Aisha and her lover. And I never remember the details. <laughs> so all these fantasies turn out the same, you know. So um, I listen politely, but don't make an attempt to remember. She was a good guy, nevertheless. And I like that picture because of the pavilion up there in the left-hand corner. And if anyone reads Chinese, I would like to know what that says. Does anybody read Chinese? It has to say something about the stone forest, Shilin, but also could say something about the caves. Because right next to here are our caves. I don't like pictures of the caves because they're psychedelic colors. And they, I never can photograph them very well, so you will see no pictures of caves there. But I like the way, it doesn't remind me of Arches National Park entirely, but I do like the way the stones are resting on each other. You can tell I like the stone forest. Now we're climbing a hill in the town of Dali. Maybe because I worked in uh, civil engineering at the University of Toledo at one time, that I'm fascinated by bridges, bridge building. And so uh, I'm climbing because this is taken, this is an aerial, aerial view. So I, I'm interested in the construction right down here. What kind of equipment are they using to build the bridges? And then the piers that they set in, and then the deck and then how that all is going to come together. And there's the town of Dali across from the lake. Going back, that's all finished. I, I really would like to see that, actually. But it's a long climb up this mountain. And the steps in this mountain were carved by the Taoist priests many years, many centuries ago, actually. So it's all, each step is a different width, it's a different height. It has crevices. You have to be so careful. You don't look down, actually. You, look, you don't look around. You look down to see where your feet are going to be placed next. It's an area called Western Hills. There's a lot of Taoist temples. There's a lot of Buddhist temples. It's really, truly a, a special site for the Chinese. So you can sort of see the distance from the lake up this cliff and up these steps and we go, oh my God, these things are up here now. And we go here and now here I am. And you can tell Tina's pictures from mine because hers has that kind of date stamp on it. So she was taking my photo. So I think it says, lady, you did a good job. You have a long <laughs> life. <laughs> It has to say something like that because I made it up there. Yeah, it, does, it, does, it has some auspicious um, saying to it for sure. There are a lot of tourist things that around Dali, and one of them is um, dyeing. 
and that guy has a bat and he's dying purple, I think. And the, or then this uh, woman down below, she has all the different colors. And then tie-dye, I think the upper right is, Tina really is admiring that. Now that's tie-dye, but I, they also did batik, because I have a tablecloth that's not tie-dye, that's batik. So, very artistic there. We're back on the van, and we're driving through the countryside. <laughs> Just by looking at my pictures, you know I love driving through the countryside. Ah, there's a pungent, pungent odor. What is that? It's familiar in a way, but what are those people now doing out in the field? What is it? Onion. Garlic, folks. Garlic. Oh my God, the Chinese say you have garlic cure for everything. <laughs> garlic soup. Oh, garlic is a treasured. Um, a substance with the Chinese. So the women were out digging, I guess you dig garlic, and, and then they pour, they have it weighed, and then they get paid by the weight, and then they put it in the dump truck through the restaurants. But in the background, you can see these little um, things dotting the hillside. Um, that's not very fertile land up there. So those are tombs, tombs of the ancestors. Maybe they just drop dead in the field. Don't <laughs> They seem to be working awfully hard. Oh, and this is just a picture taken, oh my golly, at night from my hotel room because I think it's so beautiful. In the foreground, you have the, um, the, the curved roof line and then all the houses down in the valley light and then the uh, pavilion up at the top of the hill. I just think that's a nice photograph. Okay, we've traveled north in our van and we go to Lijian. I have no really good pictures of Lijian. And it's a very famous um, city of the 9th century, I think. And I read <laughs> that it's built in a dam. I don't know how you build a city in a dam. But all I know is there's lot, many, many canals in that city and many, many stone bridges crossing those canals. It's not like uh, Venice, because Venice, you know, you have the boats and all of that. Here you don't have the boats. Well, if you do, they're tiny boats. It, 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 they're, they they don't, aren't used for transportation. The reason we don't have photos is because Tina and I had our picture taken in front of here which is when you enter, this obviously says Li Jiang and the age and the distance and all of that. And, but I miss the water wheels. Because that, that shows that you know the city is noted for its water, its cleanliness of water. One of the things I learned with downtown in, in the old part of the city, I bought something. I don't remember what it was. It was the first time I ever encountered no plastic bags. There was, it was absolutely none available. You bought a cloth bag. They are extremely environmentally conscious here. Extremely so. Now outside of Lijiang, Lijiang is pretty touristy. Outside, maybe 10 miles outside of Lijiang, is a city town, village, called Stone Village. Because everything is built out of stone. You can see stone, stone, stone. But they have an ancient system that they use called three wells. They still use it. Okay, so here, there's a, one of the three big rivers that go into the Yangtze River is in this part of Yunnan province. So here you have the different wells. The water is clean, clean, clean. And the clean water, people come and wash their vegetables. Because that it's drinking water and it's washing vegetables water. So then the water goes downstream to this restaurant. And they use the coldness of the water. I don't know if that's a bottle of Coca-Cola or a bottle of beer. <laughs> they want to keep it cold. So and then you get out further and you can wash your clothes. So, you know, pure water at the top, and then as you go down and down further, then it becomes laundry water. 
that you don't drink. And then this is the downtown. See how quiet it is? The water's no longer gushing. It's a very, very pretty town. The town is the home of the Nazi people. Now, I had a hard time with this word because the X in Chinese is a H A S H sound. So we say Na Shi. Well, as I was looking for more information, now they call it Naki people. So it's a hard language to know. But these people, they, they have their own, I don't want to say they have their own government, but they don't. But they have their own custom, and they have their own leaders, and they have their own costumes. And they're putting on a dance for us, and Tina's right back here watching. Later she joins in. I love those people. And so did Tina. Tina's Chinese. I mean, she's Shia. She doesn't know about these Nashi people. She's never met one. The Chinese, before they became recent middle class people, they never traveled outside of their own little neighborhood or their own province. So to her, this was as new as it was to me, a foreigner. And they had, we had to attend an orchestra performance. They had their own instruments. They have their own language called Dung Ba. That was Tina's first encounter with that language. And then the chieftain, I guess that's what he is, she had to have her picture taken with the chieftain. She was just mesmerized by these people. And way up north of Lijiang is Jade Dragonstone Mountain, 15,000 feet, five treacherous peaks. It is, I could never, ever take a photo of the extensive mountain range there. So is there hiking? Uh, not too much, really. You ever hear of anybody hiking J. Dragon Stone Mountain? But they have a tourist place there called Tiger Leaping Gorge. I think the depth, the depth of this gorge or canyon is double that of uh, Grand Canyon. I think it's 12,000 more feet, because mm -hmm. they do meters. And you can take it and sort of see right there about this, it says 3,900 <laughs> meters as to where this is right here. 3,900, I would say 4,000 times 3 point something. And it's over 12,000, but anybody has a calculator would <laughs> be more, more precise than I am. But anyway, again, there's a story. Hunters were chasing a tiger. And the tiger came to this, this stretch of water, which is about 85 feet across. How's the tiger going to get across and escape for his life? Well, he's going to jump across this brave tiger, but I took this, because I'm standing, you know where I'm standing in that prior photograph, you can see the gushing water. Here's the walkway we walked on. Whoa, whoa, <clears throat> that is treacherous. That, looking back, I've sort of done some treacherous things, I guess. But, <laughs> that, oh my goodness, within 200 meters, notice the rock slide. And then, please is run about by cliff. <laughs> I think they mean walk quickly. But sometimes the translation is a little difficult. But just by looking at it and just by being there, you can guess. Don't, don't, don't delay. Walk fast. You don't know when the rocks come down on you. <laughs> but I really like, you know, I really like the path. Actually, it was very pretty. It might have been dangerous, but it was beautiful. <coughs> Tina made a friend, and this is what you're walking under. Yeah, those, those points of that rock look awfully sharp, don't they? And you don't know how steady the base is. But it's beautiful. But <laughs> sometimes you don't walk on the edge, you walk through a tunnel. Uh, that tunnel is deep. <coughs> 
And uh, we see a fellow over there with his chisel, and he is making the tunnel larger, or he's making a niche in the tunnel for something. But let's hope that they use more than a hammer and chisel <laughs> to make that large tunnel. And there's the, there's the rock. The tiger leaped from there. He leaped on this rock, saved his life. And from there, he could leap over here. So that's tiger leaping gorge and tiger leaping rock. Pretty awesome. Did you ever think China was like this? It's pretty awesome. Okay, now we're almost finished, and we're going to fly. We're going to fly from Lijiang. We're going to go down here to the tropics again. Because this woman likes the tropics. The airport, as soon as you get to the airport, there's that, like, from flying from here to Orlando, you get off and there's this humid smell. I love that humidity. And that's what we have in Jing um, Hong. And the airport is a nice design. The mountains are there in the background. And there's a different kind of Buddhism here. Um, you can see in the hills, the temples. It's, and then it's a big Buddha in the hill. So it's a, it's a different tropical place. Oh, I have to go back one. Oh, come on, let me go back one. And there's something about that city that was um, I didn't, I had a bad feeling about this city. It was like, um, why are these beauty shops open 24 hours a day? <laughs> I said to Tina, let's take a bus and get out of the city. Just pick out a bus line. So she did, and we took it to the end of the line through rice paddies. And we get to this great big grounds of a monastery. It's a school for the monks, too, because I didn't take any of their pictures. That wasn't polite. But there's a great big school for the monks. And there's all these different temples there. And we're looking around and figuring things out, admiring the architecture. And we're almost ready to walk this lane to exit the gate. And we see this man. But he didn't look like that. He was sitting on a stool, and he had his shirt off. Chinese men do not appear in public with their shirts off, especially with this foreign woman around. So he quickly put his shirt on, and then Tina goes into a conversation with him. And his nickname is a bird expert, because this was the time of H1N5. Bird flu, avian influenza. So his job was to follow the migration of the birds from the south to the north of China. And that was the vehicle that he was using. Now, Tina has given herself the name the Golden Translation Machine. <laughs> and because she did a lot of translating, because for the next two days, he became our guide. He picked us up at our hotel the next morning, and he became our guide. And the first place that he took us was that river. And this sits pretty nice. Tina and I are out there in the river enjoying it. And he tells me it's the Lankong River. It's like, no, that's the Mekong River. No, that's not. That's what you people call it, the Mekong. That's not the right name. It's the Lankong River but it's the same river. <laughs> and I think of it in Vietnam. Remember, that was a, a, a big thing that goes, and that's Tina's picture, which I absolutely love. So she took that. So we're at the Mekong River in China, in southern China. Tina notices the difference in architecture. We don't have those, those, that kind of architecture in northern China. So that's her photo, and she was taken by that. And then there's an older photo, because this is lowland, and so that is a, maybe not an original structure, but an old structure with a tin roof, and that's a new structure that's being built. 
in the bottom right hand corner. <clears throat> We're way far south now, and the elephant is is a symbol of uh, reverence, you might say. The elephants have good memories, they bring good luck, they're family, they're empathetic animals, and so the elephants make a, a, a big impression in this culture. That's downtown and where, we, where we are. Because they're having this water spout splashing festival. Usually this festival is in April and it's to commemorate the birth of Buddha. But we're not there in April, we're there in February. So this is, have, has become like a tourist attraction. That sort of bothers me because some things in China are no longer authentic. They become tourist attractions. And in doing that, they lose some of that authenticity. But here they are. The music is blaring. It's blaring. And the, the, the women and the men are parading in their beautiful, colorful costumes. Notice what they have on their heads. The Water Splashing Festival is called because after they parade around, they take their hats off and start throwing water on one another. <laughs> and there is our <laughs> guy, you might call him. He's in there. There's no way Tina and I are getting that water. <laughs> no way. But you see the big elephant, and this is a, a very special religious ceremony, the authentic one, is for the people of the region. And we get invited into their home. The lady on the left, isn't she beautiful? Her dress, she's so beautiful. And then we sit on the floor, and Tina, the golden translation machine, is talking. I just like that picture on the left of the lady out there riding her tricycle. But I notice the, the room is very large, but there's no soft chairs or cushions or sofas. Instead, the whole center part is just floor. One wall has a TV, another wall has the kitchen stuff, and that wall has a desk with this thing above it. And it's like, what's that? Well, the lady and Tina are having this intense discussion about that thing over there. Anybody want to guess what that is? Peacock. Yes, peacock feathers because the peacocks are as important, if not more important, than the elephants in that culture. Oh my goodness, another field. We're on our way to the airport. We're going to take in as much as we can of Shashpana before we go back to work in Xi'an. Ah, what are they growing there? More garlic? No, it doesn't smell like garlic. Poppies? Mm, no, not poppies. <laughs> Strawberries. Oh, I love picking strawberries. I could be at Haynes, 10 minutes from my house, picking strawberries, which I do every June. And here I am in the southern part of China picking strawberries. Now, my guy there, he has a uniform on. Guess what? You don't see his belt buckle because it's hidden, but P-L-A. What does that mean? People's Liberation Army. So in our conversation with Tina, we found out that his father fought for the side of North Korea in the Korean War. And as so often happens in this country, sons follow fathers in whatever occupation. So he joined the People's Liberation Army. And that's, he, he's more like in his full uniform, not, not really full uniform, but you can tell he's a soldier in that, that picture. And then I, I, I'm intrigued by those huts out in the field, the camaraderie of the fight field hands. But inside of here is just one bed, cot, but a nice new motorcycle. Oh. Instead of pickup truck, they love the motorcycle. We're on our way to the airport still, and this woman invites us into her back porch. And she has corn and husks. See, she has the fire built there. She has the wood. She has the wood fire. And she invites us to have some, I call it sweet corn. So we're sitting there, 
and this little like little lady and having a good time. And the motorcycle. <laughs> yes, of course. <clears throat> And then I'm thinking, how did we have all these wonderful experiences? We're not in a tour group. We're just travelers. We're sort of spontaneous. How do we do this? And one, I think, is because of his status as a PLA member, People's Liberation Army, and maybe a foreigner. And you put a foreigner in a PLA together, it's like, hmm. What are they doing traveling this country? Maybe she's a spy. <laughs> anyway, uh, there we go. And what you saw and correctly identified, the peacock feathers, I, I had to use, do some, some research. And that's my favorite quote. quote, uh, quote Travel is more than just the seeing of this, or the seeing of that, the seeing of that. It's the change that goes on in your own heart and in, in how you live your life. It, it's just not seeing sights. It's actually it's sort of immersing in the culture and learning their values and how that's going to change me. And that was a quote way back from this thing. But she is a dancer. Um, she has made famous the peacock dance. Look at the grace. Look at her arm. Look at her wrist. Look at her fingers. Her grace. That was probably taken 20 years ago. She's 66 now. And she has a lot of orthopedic problems. Because think of how, and, and she doesn't eat food food. She eats flower petals. Because she has to keep her weight down. So, folks, you have any questions? <laughs> I hope, you, I hope you have a different opinion of China now and how diverse it is and how big it is and everything that's going on there. Yes. 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 Why why is that little island out way south compared to the rest of the mainland of China? If you're if, if you're going to be attacked. What's usually attacked? It's the capital city, isn't it? And your bigger cities. So if they have something going on that they want to not be destroyed at the first glance, if they're going to put it away from the population centers and put it on the island. Why do we have our forces on Hawaii? You know, they have a big military naval base in, on Hainan. They have nuclear subs on, on Hainan. Do, do you think we have a naval base in Hawaii? Do you think we have nuclear subs in Hawaii? Yes, we do. Yeah, same thing, same principle. Yes? So it looks like you were able to travel freely and go anywhere you wanted uh, back then. Is that same policy still apply today, or do you have to go on a tour group? Or, uh... Some people are, feel more safety in a tour group because you are, you are more safe, okay? But if I'm traveling with a native Japanese, a Chinese person, then I rely on her background, her credentials, and everybody's checked out, so it's okay. I, I, I wouldn't do it in Cuba, though, because, you know, when you have your, um, you, have to, you have to give your passport number ahead of time, and you know your passport's being checked out. So, I like to go with the registered group there. I really don't like to get into trouble. I mean, I'm really a cautious traveler. Although it may not seem that way, I am, really. Yes? This may seem like a silly question, but how did the strawberries taste? Did they taste as good as at home? OK, I am fanatic about cleanliness. So at Haynes, I can pick and eat, but not very often. I take them home and wash them. I'm not going to eat them there from the field. No. Sorry, I did not taste them. Okay. When I lived there and, and um, wanted strawberries, I would boil water, let it cool, wash the strawberries, <laughs> and then rinse the strawberries, and then eat them. So I ate a lot of bananas. <laughs> 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 you have to do all that work, you know. 
Yes. Oh, there's quite a bit of uh, talk about the political issues we have with China. Uh, did you have any observations of how that affected the relations with the United States or other countries? No, I, I, if an American president were visiting, I would make sure to take photos, uh, of, of photos of the newspaper. There's an English newspaper called China Daily, and it only is published a couple of times a week. I would, I would always read that newspaper. But at the same time, you knew everything was censored. Everything was approved before the stories got in. And you know, in our newspapers, it's always this bad stuff. This murder, that murder, that robbery. Duh, duh. No, no, no. In China, there was a fire in the bus that I always took downtown. You think I could get any information about that fire? Absolutely not. Bad things do not happen. <laughs> <laughs> yes. How do you compare your Chinese meals with American food? The Chinese have a lot of variety. And a friend's daughter said about Kung Pao chicken. I said, Kung Pao chicken? I never had it. She said, oh, you Americans, you all have Kung Pao chicken. I said, never tasted it. But the variety of food is wonderful. Fresh fruits and vegetables, like down in Yunnan province, wonderful. But beware. A person who went after me, her husband was a high-tech person, and he was doing presentations at conferences and things. She came back extremely sick. She had to go to the hospital every day for 10 days for whatever, IVs, because this is what happened. Maybe she was eating cucumber, like I was eating cucumbers down in, um, on the island. But whoever used that knife, they cut raw meat. Oh. And then the next thing, they sliced the cucumber, and that made her deathly sick. So, you know, this is odd, but when I go to a restaurant, I get hot water with lemon. <laughs> I pick that up in China because I want boiled water. You know, I, I, because I don't want to get sick. I'm a baby when I'm sick, and I have no one to take care of me in China. So I avoid getting sick. Yes. They don't eat cat there, do they? You know that little myth about cats? I don't think it's a myth. Oh, no. <laughs> I think it's more dog. Cat and dog? Yeah. More dog. And it's in Guangzhou. It's that part of, I don't go to that part of China. It's the east coast, the southeast coast. And Guangzhou, I, a friend from college, and she's a very good friend from college. She was from Hong Kong. And so um, she was working for Park Davis in Ann Arbor. And they were having a, a party. And she said, Barbara, don't eat the meat. So I don't even, I, I become sort of a vegetarian or just seafood when I'm in China. Okay, yeah, one more. What's the cost as far as like retail restaurant food, as far as price? Well, I remember my salary was $500 a month. <laughs> so I, I travel very frugally, let's put it that way. The only time we stayed in a four star hotel was Tina when she bargained that in Kumei, you know, the dog picture. Yeah, yeah. That was a really fancy four star hotel, and she bargained that. But other than that, no, I traveled not, not, not excessively well.